The Man Who Was Thursday, A Nightmare, by G.K. Chesterton. Episode 1, The Two Poets of Saffron Park. My nightmare began on a particular evening that, if it is remembered for nothing else, will be remembered in that place for its strange sunset. It looked like the end of the world. Across the great sky were the strangest tints of violet and mauve, and an unnatural pink or pale green. But towards the west, the clouds flared past description, transparent and passionate, with the last red-hot plumes of the sun shining through like something too good to be seen. The sight was as vivid as the events that followed, which are now forever imprinted on my mind. These events, like this sunset, were too fantastic to be real, but I cannot deny the profound effect they have had on my life since then. Others may remember that night because it marked the appearance of the second poet of Saffron Park. That would be me. Up until that moment, the park was dominated by a red-haired orator by the name of Lucian Gregory. An artist is identical with an anarchist. You might transpose the words anywhere. Night after night, he preached about the art of lawlessness and the lawlessness of art. People would stop to listen, particularly women who we might call emancipated. An anarchist is an artist. Uh, The man who throws a bomb is an artist because he prefers a great moment to everything. He was helped by the arresting oddity of his appearance, with his hair carefully parted in the middle, and a face that seemed like a blend of one part angel and one part ape. He sees how much more valuable is one burst of blazing light, one peal of perfect thunder, than the mere common bodies of a few shapeless policemen. I stood and listened to him espouse his extremist theories and politics, waiting patiently for the perfect moment to interject. An artist disregards all governments, abolishes all conventions. The poet delights in disorder only. If it weren't so, the most poetical thing in the world would be the Underground Railway. I happen to find the Underground quite poetical. Everyone looked at me as if I had at that moment fallen out of that impossible sky. Nonsense! Why do all the poor saps on the railway trains look so sad and tired? Because they know that whatever place they bought a ticket for is the place they will go. After they've passed Sloan Square, they know for certain that the next station is Victoria and nothing but Victoria. Oh, their wild rapture. Oh, their eyes like stars and their souls again in Eden if the next station were unaccountably Baker Street. Baker Street? If what you say is true... Those saps are as prosaic as your poetry. The rare strange thing is to hit the mark. The gross obvious thing is to miss it. Chaos is dull, because in chaos, the train might indeed go anywhere, to Baker Street or to Baghdad. But man is a magician, and his whole magic is in this, that he does say Victoria, and lo, it is Victoria. (laughs) I... I don't believe I've had the pleasure. Friend, I too am a poet. But I'm afraid I differ from you upon the whole nature of poetry. My name is Gabriel Sign, A poet of law, a poet of order. Nay, even a poet of respectability. <laughs> uh, how fascinating. How fascinating that a night of clouds and cruel colours has brought us such an aberration as a respectable poet. You say you are a poet of law? I say you are a contradiction in terms. Every time a train comes in, I feel that man has won a battle against chaos. When I hear the god shout out the word, Victoria, to me, it is a war cry of victory. (laughs) Victoria! (laughs) And yet we poets would ask, what is Victoria now that you've got there? The poet is discontented even in the streets of heaven. The poet is always in revolt. What is so poetical about being in revolt? You might as well say that it is poetical to be seasick. 
It is things going right that is poetical. Take, for instance, our digestive system. We take for granted that it silently and sacredly does its amazing work. That is the foundation of all poetry. Above all, the most poetical thing on earth is to not be vomiting. In that moment, my eye caught sight of a young woman laughing off to the side. She also had golden red hair, though hers was free and waved softly in the wind. Really? The examples you choose? I beg your pardon. I forgot we had abolished all conventions. You don't expect me to revolutionize society on this lawn? No, I don't. But I suppose that if you were serious about your anarchism, that is exactly what you would do. You don't think, then, that I am serious about my anarchism? Come again. I was revolting against listening. (laughs) Am I not serious about my anarchism? My dear fellow. I waved him off and casually walked away from the scene. I could tell that Gregory had lost his grip on the crowd around him. As I strolled down the street, I heard someone behind me. Wait! Pardon me. Tell me your name again. Gabriel Sy. At your service. Yours? Rosamond. Your rival is my brother. I'm sorry if I got him too riled up. Oh no. Believe me, I've seen him worse. I wanted to ask you... Well, were you being serious back there? Do people who talk like you and my brother often mean what they say? Do you? Do I mean what I say? My dear Miss Gregory, there are many kinds of sincerity and insincerity. Put it this way. At the table, when you say thank you for the salt, do you mean what you say? If you mean am I genuinely thankful, then I suppose... No, you say it out of habit. Whether you mean it or not. Now, sometimes a man like your brother rarely finds a thing that he does mean. And it doesn't matter if it's only a half-truth, a quarter-truth, a tenth-truth. He will say it much more than he means simply from the sheer force of meaning it. Is he really an anarchist, then? Only in that sense. Or nonsense, if you prefer. But he wouldn't actually use a bomb or anything. (laughs) No, no, no. Ah, he's not the type. Believe me. I would know. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Besides, why should he risk throwing it all away when he has such a beautiful sister? Now, is that a half-truth, a quarter-truth, or a tenth-truth? I mean what I say. Well, good night then, Mr. Syme. It was very nice meeting you. And the same to you, Miss Gregory. Good night. In the wild events which were to follow, this girl had no official role to play. And yet in some indescribable way, she kept recurring like a motif in music through all the mad adventures afterwards and the glory of her strange hair ran like a red thread through those dark and ill-drawn tapestries of the night. For what followed was so improbable that it might well have been a dream. I could kill you right now if I wanted. That would certainly bring some anarchy into my life. (laughs) Insolent fool! Listen, I'm sorry if I embarrassed you, Better. Silence! It has nothing to do with that! Good. What then shall we talk about? This lamppost and this tree, order and anarchy. A straight, iron, ugly lamppost is your precious order. And this is anarchy, splendidly unique and clothed in nature's beauty. Right, but if it weren't for the lamp, we wouldn't even be able to see the tree. Call me traditional, but I don't think you'd ever see the lamppost by the light of the tree. Were you waiting out here just to continue our little debate? No, I don't want to continue. I want to end it forever. You have irritated me. Something which no man has succeeded in doing before. Indeed. Well, one. I truly am sorry. Sorry isn't good enough. Death isn't good enough for you. I have to prove you wrong. Whatever it takes. Look, it was just a silly debate. You said I wasn't serious about anarchy. No, I never doubted you were sincere. But that's it. I'm just mouthing off a theory I picked up from a bloody pamphlet. You don't think I'm really serious. I mean in a deeper, much deadlier way. If you want to confess something, go right ahead. I almost went to seminary. Are you a religious man? We are all Catholics now. Then will you swear by your God... 
that you will never expose what I'm about to show you to any living person, especially the police. What? Do you swear it? Knowing that if you break this oath, it could mean your death. And what do I get out of this oath? I will promise you an extremely entertaining evening. <laughs> your offer sounds so ridiculous, I couldn't possibly refuse. Besides, I'm sure an anarchist can be trusted well enough. All right, I swear on my Christian honor, and as a fellow artist, that I won't report any of this, whatever it is, to anyone. Especially not the police. So what is it? Let's get a cab. The cab took us to a particularly dreary beer shop, where we quickly swept inside. We were seated in a dim sort of bar at a stained wooden table with one wooden leg. The room was so small and dark that very little could be seen of the bartender, who I had the vague impression was something bulky and bearded. What are you drinking? I'll have a creme de menthe. How about a glass of your finest burgundy? Very good, sir. Excuse me if I'm not used to a nightmare leading to a fine drink. Usually, it's the other way around. <laughs> Believe me, you are not dreaming. In fact, you are close to the most actual and rousing moment of your existence. The look of this place is all part of our modesty. <laughs> We're the most modest men on earth. And who exactly are we? We are the serious anarchists. The ones you don't believe exist. <laughs> Well, you do carry the finest wine. Oh, yes. We are serious about everything. Uh, pardon me when I <clears throat> adjust this table. It's kind of a screw. Yes, I can see it turning. Is this some way you've devised that we'd swap glasses? Uh, don't be surprised if you feel a sudden head rush. It's not the wine. How do you mean? Well, that's quite a contraption. Welcome to the underground. Follow me. He guided me down a vaulted passage, at the end of which was a small but heavy iron door with a red lantern hanging over it. Mr. Joseph Chamberlain. It must have been some sort of password. Inside, the passage gleamed as if it were lined with a network of steel. On a second glance, I realized it was actually made up of ranks and ranks of rifles and revolvers, closely packed and interlocked. Sorry about all these processes. We have to be very strict down here. Don't be sorry. I know how much you anarchists love laws and order. Hmm. And now, welcome to the lion's den. We entered a large, spherical room, filled with benches and a lectern, like a meeting hall. Scattered throughout the room were containers of various substances and other oddly shaped devices. This is a bomb. <laughs> yes! Oh, I'd break 20 more oaths of secrecy just to see that look on your face! <laughs> what do you think now? I must admit, there is more to you than it seems. This room is the hub of all terrorist activities in the city. A haven for anyone with the desire to destroy. Permit me to ask two questions. What is this really about? Do you wish to abolish government? To abolish God! We don't merely want to break a few laws instituted by man. We wish to deny all those arbitrary distinctions of vice and virtue, honor and treachery. The silly sentimentalist of the French Revolution talked of the rights of man. We hate rights. As we hate wrongs, we have abolished right and wrong. <laughs> While you're at it, could you get rid of right and left too? They're much more troublesome to What was your second question? Right. You seem to go to an awful lot of trouble to keep this place secret. As you should. So why the devil do you go out in public and tell everyone you're an anarchist? <laughs> Simple. 
Out there, I swore I was a serious anarchist, and you didn't believe me. Nobody up there takes us seriously, not until they see this place. Point taken. It was actually the suggestion of our great leader, the president of the Central Anarchist Council, the greatest man alive today. What's his name? <laughs> you wouldn't know him. That's part of his genius. Unlike other so-called great men, he puts all his efforts into not being heard of. And he isn't. I see. Oh, his intellect is unparalleled. He said, as long as I dress like an anarchist, nobody would ever bother me. <laughs> but I have preached bloody murder on the street corner day and night to these women, and some would even have me kiss their newborn children. <laughs> well, you sure put one over on me. What do you call this terrific president of yours? Most of us call him Sunday. There are seven members of the Central Anarchist Council, each named after the days of the week. He is called Sunday, by some of his admirers, Bloody Sunday. I feel for the man called Monday. What a depressing day of the week. Please don't touch that. <clears throat> These items are for whomever we elect to be our new Thursday. Our current Thursday was martyred last week. Tonight we have a meeting to vote on his replacement. I uh, shouldn't tell you this, but the election is practically settled. <laughs> We'll go through the whole process, of course, but I've pretty much got it wrapped up. Outstanding. I congratulate you. Oh, this is it. A tugboat awaits out back to take me to my first council meeting tomorrow. Oh, then the wild joy of being Thursday. Uh, Gregory, why is it that I really like you? Maybe because you're such a complete ass. Oh, damn it all. This is the funniest situation I've ever been in, and I can't contain myself. Mr. Gregory, the promise I made to you, I wouldn't break for a million pounds. Now, will you give me, for my own safety, an oath of your own? An oath? I swore before God that I wouldn't tell the police about this. Now, will you swear by humanity, or whatever the hell you believe in, that you will not tell my secret to the anarchists. Your secret? You have a secret? Yes, I have a secret. Will you swear? All, all right. I'm too curious, so... Yes. I swear not to tell the anarchists anything you tell me, but fast, they'll be here any minute. Well, I don't really know how to tell you this, but your little disguise as a harmless anarchist is not quite as clever as you'd like to think. You see, we've known about that trick for some time in the yard. What did you say? It's true. I am an undercover detective for Scotland Yard. But I think I hear your friends coming. I shall blow your brains out right here! Oh, put that away! What does it matter? Don't you get it? It's a stalemate. I can't tell the authorities that you're an anarchist, and you can't tell the anarchists that I'm an agent of the police. If either of us broke our promise, it would be our death. All we can do is watch in a lonely intellectual duel. My mind against yours. No help from Scotland Yard. No help from the anarchists. Except... You're not the one soon to be surrounded by suspicious terrorists. You watch me. I'll probably give myself away in the first five minutes. I don't believe in the afterlife, but if you break your word, God would make a special hell just for you. I won't break my word. And neither will you. If you did, I'd have a swarm of policemen down here before you could blink. The clan of anarchists were a motley bunch, apparently from all walks of life, representing all ages, races, and classes. You have ten seconds to explain before I spill his blood! Mohammed, please put that away. Everything is fine. This is one of our allies, from another city, Mr. Gabriel Syme. 
I'm glad to see your hall is well guarded. What branch do you represent? <laughs> I'd hardly call it a branch. More like a root. What do you mean? The, the truth is, I, I've been specially sent here to see that you show a proper observance of Sunday. <sighs> well then, I suppose we'd better give you a seat in the meeting. If you ask my advice, I'd say you'd better. Let's get started. The car is already here. Comrade Mohammed will chair the meeting. Comrades, we have some very important business tonight. You all know that we have the honor of selecting a Thursday to serve on the Central Council, and again we are faced with this decision. We all lament the sad capture of the previous Thursday. He was a great asset to the cause, as I'm sure will be his successor. To begin, I would like to open the floor for suggestions of candidates. Anyone? Yes. <coughs> I move that Lucian Gregory be elected Thursday. Do I hear a second? Second. Before we vote, I'd like to bring up Mr. Gregory to make a statement. Now we'll hear exactly what you're about. Count on it. <laughs> Comrades, I don't need to stand up here and tell you what I believe, because my beliefs are the same as yours. These beliefs have been slandered, mocked, distorted, and confused, but they have never been altered. Men have said horrible things about us, even though they've never actually heard what we have to say. Rumors spread and become lies causing us to become the most hated of all men. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's why we assemble underground, just as the Christians were forced to assemble in the catacombs of the Roman Empire. But if, by some freak accident, there happened to be one man in our presence tonight who has completely misunderstood us all his life, I would say to him, when those Christians met in those catacombs, what sort of moral reputation did they have in the streets above? What lies about their beliefs did the so-called educated whisper about them? Suppose I would say to him that we are repeating that great paradox of history, that we anarchists may seem as crazy as the Christians were known as then, but we are really just as harmless and meek as they were in private. I'm not meek. Maybe not on the surface, Comrade Patterson, but underneath that ferocious exterior is a true foundation of meekness that only we can see. I tell you, we are like the true early Christians, only we have come later with even more radical beliefs. We are simple, modest, and merciful. No, no. I say we are merciful, just as the early Christians were merciful. But this didn't stop them from being accused of eating human flesh. No, we don't eat human flesh. Shame. Why not? Look, Comrade Patterson wants to know why nobody's eating him. <laughs> In our society, at any rate, which loves him sincerely and is founded on love. Love? Which is founded on love. No, no, we hate love. If I am chosen as representative of this body, there will be no difficulty in the goals we pursue together. We shall carry on, despite the slanders that paint us as assassins and enemies of society. We shall fight with moral courage and quiet intellectual pressure for our ideals of brotherhood and simplicity. Does anyone oppose the election of Comrade Gregory? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I oppose. The chair recognizes Mr. Gabriel Syme. Comrades, is this what we came here for? 
Do we live underground like rats, only to listen to a speech we could have heard in Sunday school? Do we surround ourselves with weapons and bar the door, only to hear Mr. Gregory preach to us, honesty is the best policy, and virtue is its own reward? There was not a word in his speech that even the Pope would object to. Yeah, that's right. But I am not a priest, and I do not approve of what I just heard. Any man who gives a Sunday school lesson is not fit to make a resolute, forcible, and efficient Thursday. Mr. Gregory believes that we are not the enemies of society. But I say that we are the enemies of society, for society is the enemy of humanity, its oldest and most pitiless enemy. <laughs> Mr. Gregory has told us that we are not murderers. There, I agree. We aren't murderers. We are executioners. <laughs> you goddamned hypocrite. Mr. Gregory knows full well that I am holding up my end of the bargain and doing nothing but my duty. But let's get down to it. I say that Mr. Gregory is unfit to be Thursday. I stand against him and say, rather than have his pathetic mercy and love infect the Supreme Council, I would instead offer myself for election. Stop! Hey, you idiot! Stop! I do not go to the council to deny the rumors that we are murderers. I go to earn it! No! I move that Mr. Sign be appointed the new Thursday. Stop all this! I'm telling you, you must stop! Does anyone second the amendment? I end all this! This man cannot be elected. He is a... Yes? What is he? Yeah. He is a man who has no experience in our work. I second the election of Mr. Stein. The amendment will, as usual, be put to a vote. The question is that- Comrades, I am not crazy. Oh, oh! I'm not crazy, but my advice sounds crazy because I can't give you a good reason for it. Call it a command, or whatever, but you must listen to me. Do not elect this man! <laughs> Mr. Gregory commands? <laughs> Who are you to order us? You aren't Sunday? And you are not on Thursday! Comrades! I, I, I don't care what you think of me. I throw myself at your mercy. I'm begging you, do not elect this man. Sorry, Gary. All in favor of electing Gabriel Sam to the post of Thursday on the General Council. <laughs> Dot, meeting adjourned. You evil, backstabbing coward. And you are a man of your word. You tricked me. This is entrapment! You were the one who forced me to come here. The way I see it, you brought this on yourself. The boat is ready, comrade Sime. Please, step this way. They led me out a nondescript door, behind which showed a sudden blue and silver picture of the moonlit river. It looked like a scene in a theater. Close to the opening lay a dark, dwarfish steamboat, like a baby dragon with one red eye. You kept your word. Thank you. Even to the smallest detail of your promise. What do you mean? What did I promise? An extremely entertaining evening. I saluted the stunned anarchist with some crude form of a proper military salute. He watched me as the steamboat gently glided down the River Thames.
The Man Who Was Thursday was written and directed by Andrew Walquist, based on the novel by G.K. Chesterton. This episode featured performances by Jacob Sidney as Gabriel Syme, Eric Curtis Johnson as Lucian Gregory, Lana Joy as Rosamond Gregory, and Gregory Gifford Giles as Comrade Mohammed. The music was composed and arranged by David Stanton. A full list of credits, special thanks, and sound effects can be found on our website, www.manwhowasthursday.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned for episode two of The Man Who Was Thursday. <laughs>